Mount St. Helens was a pristine playground in southwestern Washington. Like Mount Hood and Mount Rainier, and so many other snow-capped peaks in the northwest, surrounded by crystal clear lakes and lush green forests. But I'm telling you, I'm not brave. I'm brave about the mountain. I couldn't understand how in the world the mountain could ever get me in Spirit Lake. Until May 18th, 1980. Its powerful blast ripped apart lives, killing dozens of people, washing away homes, and demolishing everything in its path for miles. The volcano's blasts have come with a vengeance today. The spectacle of the massive plume is one that few will forget. Decades later, life returns. The mountain is recovering. But because of what we witnessed, we know that Mount St. Helens, like most Northwest volcanoes, is only sleeping for now. To understand the power of the May 18th eruption, you have to understand the peace that was shattered. To comprehend the utter destruction, you have to witness its former beauty. And to know what was lost, you need to know what was there. The Northwest Indians knew the mountain's beauty and its power. They called it Smoking Mountain, and there were early signs that it was likely to live up to its legend. Two years before the eruption, the USGS sent out a bulletin. The bulletin was... Uh, Bob DeCarsic was the Forest Service supervisor in charge of St. Helens. And they sent the bulletin around to everybody to let them know, hey, in 10 years or so, this could happen. Well, that was a couple years, and boom, it happens. After 123 years of slumber, the mountain woke up. March 24th, Mount St. Helens started shaking 40 earthquakes an hour. The plow was swaying and uh, the truck was swaying. March 25th, a quake measuring five on the Richter scale splits open a glacier. Roadblocks go up. We're cautioning people about going up on the mountain. Forest Service spokesman Jim Unterwagner holds the first of countless news conferences. When the first little eruption started, and the earthquakes, we closed down the mountain. Much of the mountain, including summer homes on Spirit Lake, are off limits. Obviously, we locked them out of that, and it, I'll never forget, a lot of them would kind of say, Mr. Tukarczyk, we're gonna sue you. We're gonna sue you. This is John Erickson with the news bulletin. From March 27th, the volcano sends out a blast. Portland radio reporter Mike Beard sends out a breathless report. You are over Mount St. Helens, what is happening? We are directly over Mount St. Helens right now. We are at the 10,000 foot level, and there is no question at all that the volcanic activity has begun. Confirmation came only hours later. News Channel 8 brings back the first view of what was really happening. A gaping crater had opened up, the clearest warning yet that something was about to happen. Skeptics didn't believe it. Others didn't want to miss it. But the big issue, you know, was public safety. And we had a terrible time keeping people out of the area. Just waiting for more. You folks considering uh, getting out of town at all? No. Nope. I wouldn't move for nothing. Uh, nothing to be scared of. More, more danger than one of them trees falling on the backside than there is mountain of exploding. And none were more defiant than Harry Truman. And it's a funny sensation. He owned the Spirit Lake Lodge, and at 84, that mountain was as much a part of him as flesh and blood. He wasn't leaving. They, they say that the mountain is supposed to erupt and uh, the Forest Service is going to evacuate and do all that stuff yesterday, but I didn't believe any of it. I'm not going to leave here because I'm the only one up here. There's nobody else that lives up here in the wintertime. So it's going to have to run Truman off this lake, and I'm not going to go. The mountain played a cat and mouse game with flurries of activity, then uneasy periods of quiet. But as the weeks passed, scientists like Dave Johnston it's probably heating up very quickly. knew it was no longer a matter of if the mountain would erupt, but when. We're not going to have a lot of warning if a final um, big eruption starts. 
I, I think probably a day is the outside. And minutes on the inside? Yeah, minutes or it might happen without really telling us it's going to happen. It might just go. Six weeks later, it did. Dave Johnston was on duty at an observation post just north of the volcano. The eruption took his life. It was a lateral blast, the top of a mountain moving at supersonic speed, reaching a searing 660 degrees. Visualize that across the lake was Douglas fir five and six feet through, just disappearing. There's just dirt and rock left. Melting snow and ice turned the Toodle River into an unforgiving wall of water and debris. People were plucked out of harm's way. 200 homes, 27 bridges, 185 miles of road disappear. Four billion board feet of timber topples. Every bird is gone. Thousands of animals are lost. And the human toll, 57 people perish in the blast. The eruption of Mount St. Helens is big news. You know, after it happened, President Carter came to my office. And in the process, I, the next morning, I got in his chopper and I sat across from him uh, as we flew to the mountain. And because all the landscape, the trees were gone and it was so bare, it was tough to orient myself to make sure we went to the right places. Uh, someone said it was like a moonscape, but it's uh, much worse uh, than anything I've ever seen pictures of the moon's uh, surface. One of the most uh, devastating natural explosions that our nation has ever known. In the days to follow, the immediate danger gave way to a more insidious enemy, ash. The plume shoots up 80,000 feet in less than 15 minutes, and then it comes down. Blue skies turn black. There's no way to shake it. Residents of Morton, Washington, are split on whether to get out or try and stick it out. Just don't feel comfortable. You know, it's not the same as uh, it normally is, so we're going to just let the mountain do its deal for a while and find out what's going to happen, and then we'll come back. Well, we tried to wash off the sidewalks. We tried to uh, flood the streets and wash it off, and it dries out within an hour, and it's just dust, dust all over. You can see it just tracks everywhere. There's nothing we can do about it. This is a baby alder. The dust would settle, and the mountain would settle as well. Animals and plants would return, but some familiar faces would leave. Bob Tokarczyk would retire from the Forest Service in 1983. After it's all over, uh, I wouldn't have traded a minute of it for anybody. Jim Unterwagner in 91. Well, it was something that was so so unique in, in this country, in the United States. And to have been a part of that was, was something else too. A part of Northwest history, eyewitnesses as the smoking mountain of legendary beauty, Harry and 56 others were lost forever on that day. <laughs>